what is Blue Economy? The Blue Economy is a fresh way of looking at reality around us. I mean, there's a lot of poverty, um, there are a lot of people who desire to live sustainably and healthy, uh, but somehow it doesn't seem like we're succeeding. And of course, we've had over the past 30 years a lot of great initiatives uh, called the green economy and the circular economy. And, and while these are extraordinary people who, like myself, we have tried to implement this new economy, it just doesn't seem to happen. It just doesn't seem to come about to really transform our lives and that of others. And we don't seem to be able to stop that climate change and we don't seem to be able to reverse the loss of biodiversity. So what can we do? So my conclusion was that the green economy with all its merits and all its uh, good energies unfortunately became a green economy that when you want to do something good for the environment and you want to do something good for yourself, you're going to have to pay a lot more money. That means the green economy is expensive. Now, expensive means it's for the rich. I mean, we can't have an economy and a transformation of a society on the basis of something that is for those who can afford it. Therefore, my conclusion was we need to transform the logic behind it. I mean, the green economy continues by wanting to produce more of the same, always cheaper, competing globally. And if that is your wish, then unfortunately you're going to have to accept a lot of externalized costs, a lot of pollution, a lot of uh, exploitations. Uh, it's not what we like, but it's uh, the hard facts of life. So when we look at the blue economy, we said that instead of trying to always be cheaper and always compete better, why don't we first start by saying we use what we have? I mean, a sense of modesty, a sense of, of a reality check. Why do you want something that you don't have? That means you're going to have to take it away from someone else. So start with principle number one, use what you have. Second, don't look at being the cheapest, because being the cheapest that only works for the 10 biggest countries in the world. I mean, that works for India, for China, that works for Germany, for the United States, maybe Brazil, Indonesia. But let's be honest, for 190 countries around the world, they can't be the biggest and the cheapest in the world. That means that, are they excluded? No. But what is their strategy forward then? Well, what we propose is that you use what you have, number one, and number two, you generate value. I mean, you start generating more and more value. And it's so simple to explain it with a cup of coffee. Because if you drink a cup of coffee, what you take into your body is only 0.2% of the biomass that was produced by the farmer. And what happened to the 99.8%? Well, we waste it. Well, no, 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 no. It's something that we have. So use what you have generate value. So today there are more than 5,000 farms around the world where we collect the waste of the coffee and use it as a substrate to farm a mushroom. The mushroom is edible. Five kilograms of uh, coffee waste will give you at least two to three kilograms of mushrooms. So do more with what you have, generate value. And the leftovers of the coffee after you harvested the mushrooms is an extraordinary feed for your chickens. Because the mushrooms breaks down the fibers and adds amino acids, the types that the chickens like. So you just have to lay it out in front of the chickens and they will automatically eat it. They will never eat the coffee. They will only have the coffee after the mushroom has been harvested. But what do we have today? We have either a coffee that is globally traded where maybe we will be offering a bit of extra for being organic coffee and fair trade coffee. But now we have coffee and we have mushrooms, and we have chickens, and we have eggs. That is the core proposal of the blue economy. But third, what are we really doing? We're responding to basic needs of people. We're not trying to sell the latest high-speed internet, or the fastest car, or the most ecological vehicle. What we're trying to do is ensuring that with what you have, generating these chains of value, you can respond to people's needs. And Everything that is new requires something to be inspired by. And we propose that you're inspired 
by nature. Nature is our master. Nature, nature has four billion years of experience. I mean, how could we be so obnoxious and pretentious to claim that we can have the wisdom, the smartness, the intelligence, the science, the knowledge to transform the genes and transform the beings of life in order to save the problems of the world? I mean, I don't believe in that arrogance of our present today's communities. We need to be a bit more humble and say, well, instead of learning about nature, we should be learning from nature. And if we apply those principles, we see a whole range of actually ethical issues emerging. I mean, just imagine in nature, no one is unemployed. Everyone always contributes to the best of their abilities. Second, nature does no waste. I mean, we are so smart, we are so intelligent, we can make something no one wants. I mean, this is quite an interesting logic that we have uh, uh, considered as being, what, our show of intelligence? No, it's a show of stupidity. But we consider waste management as an environmental service, which it definitely is not. And so, for us, what is important in the blue economy is that we keep it simple. Just produce the basics, what we need for everyone first. But everyone has to also be defined, not only all human beings, but it has to be all living species with whom we share this planet. So, if we take it that we use what we have and we start where we are, then what would be those easy steps that every family could adapt if they wanted to step on more of a sustainable path now? So if we decide to embark on a new venture, a new way of life, um, a new way of looking at the reality around us, then we should start very simply by what we eat, what we drink, how we sleep, how we have our little nest with our family and how we manage uh, those precious moments together. And what we very often forget is that transformation is not a big decision by an international organization like the United Nations. Change happens because we change. You know, the basis of everything are the millions of little small steps that all of us are taking. But surprisingly, it can go very quick. I mean, when a baby is born, we need to take care of the babies. And one of the ways we take care of babies is by putting on diapers so they don't soil the bedding all the time. Unfortunately, those diapers are made from non-biodegradable plastics. They're filled with uh, acrylic uh, polymers that will absorb uh, the liquids. And, and, and the richness of the baby, which actually the excrements of the baby, particularly if mom has been giving breast milk, then this is of an extraordinary quality. It should never end up in a landfill. So one of the things we suggest is we should rethink how to use a diaper. We should not only rethink how to use it and not just say, oh, let's wash them. We should redesign so that whatever we have, including the excrements of the baby, should become something that can generate much more. And, and this is where we, we need to sometimes go, what I call, overboard. You gotta go crazy, you gotta go nuts, you gotta go, let your dreams go wild. Because if we start making a few calculations, we realize that every baby will produce about a ton of waste a year. Now, that is the diaper, that is the content of the diaper, and that is all the food waste, because if we're really taking care of the baby, we're going to make fresh fruit every day. We're going to make some fresh veggies every day, and that's going to create some vegetable waste and some fruit waste as well. Now, when you put it all together, that means the baby will have a thousand kilograms of waste per year. If you ferment that with some charcoal in it, with biochar, then you will be creating a very rich nutrient base for fruit trees. Now, a thousand kilograms is a thousand trees. And in 10 years time, when the baby is going to be 10 years old, those fruit trees will start bearing 50 kilograms of fruits. Now, that's how we have to start thinking. We go from a problem to actually an abundance. 
you generate such an abundance that people are embarrassed and they don't realize that how is it possible that one baby could be responsible for 50 tons of fruits for the rest of its life. I mean, this is the way we have to design the world. And that's why I'm saying it starts with what you have at home. And then probably we should start with those symbols of modernity, which clearly are, for many of us, a symbol of the wrong way to go forward. But we have the power to redesign it. it it's, as soon as we put it in our mind, as soon as we are committed to find solutions, we will find them. It will not go overnight. It will not take one day or two days or one year or five years. But that kind of transformation with that positive outlook, that will motivate many families to transform starting today. Um, if we speak of structures in Estonia and in Europe, I think it's safe to say that they're fairly strict. Um, how do you find implying eco-villages and entrepreneurship you lead in practically into those strict um, system, systems, the strict attitude of the systems in the corporate world? What could be the first steps in our cultural place in Europe? Europe is very conservative. We don't like to take risks. I mean, Europe doesn't want to change. Europe thinks it's the hotbed of culture and tradition and stability and, and ethics and, and human rights and, and you name it. We, we claim the high ground. Unfortunately, those claims may be right, maybe not, but those claims make us highly regulated. It means that for the European regulators, it's difficult to imagine that a pig and a chicken can live together because we believe that pigs should be in one corner and the chicken should be in the other corner. We believe that everything that is permitted should be regulated. And that means that it's very difficult, even when you want to, to change because your framework doesn't allow you to change. We have cast so many things in stones that we cannot just break the stones away. And that's why we need pioneers. That's why we need people who are willing to take risks. That's why we need people who say, we'll do it anyway. That's why we need people to show that what was a logic 50 years ago is no more logic today. I mean, we need, therefore, pioneering communities and societies. And that means that everyone in that community is actually an entrepreneur. We're taking risks to do things in a different way because you have no guarantee it's going to work perfectly. But you know that in order to progress, you have to get out of your comfort zones and you have to search for something new in which you believe, for which you have a certain enthusiasm, for which you can bring the energy and the drive to make it happen. So we need individuals, but we also need communities that are pioneering, and that is the Echo Village. I mean, I have learned to know some of the great Echo Villages around the world. I've been able to co-start one uh, in Latin America. And, and, and what is very clear is that when you impose yourself no frontiers, the mind wanders beyond any frontier. And, and that is what's needed. We don't need models where we follow the first and the second step where we have menus. We need to have this capacity of a community and the capacity of entrepreneurs to explore. To be explorers, again, without a watch, without a compass, but to have the heart and the soul and the desire to create a better world. Um, if we speak of sustainability and regenerating energy, and uh, you say that that itself isn't enough, um, then is sustainability, can it be viewed as some sort of a grey area that uh, the industry can use for increasing their sales? The word sustainability is abused. The word sustainability is not anymore incorporating the heart and the soul and the spirit and the wish and the desire of so many people to live happy and healthy. And, and maybe we should avoid using the word sustainability, we should just verify, is this really going to make us happy and healthy? 
happier and healthier. And we know that happiness is not always being happy and joyful. You have hard times as well. And of course, it means that we're not always able to meet everything all the time and there is no health risk, etc. But what we are in need of is to go beyond the blatant and misused and abused term of sustainability. Sustainability is what we desire, but ask people what is sustainability? Is it, as it was defined uh, 30 years ago, a way to consume today without uh, endangering future generations to be able to do the same? I don't think that is what this sustainability is all about, because what we need to do is put nature back on its evolutionary path. We need to ensure that the natural way of always progressing towards different levels of resilience, not efficiency, not maximization, not profit. We need to have resilience because this earth by design is always going through major upheavals. There will be volcanic explosions, there will be hurricanes. And actually, if the hurricanes aren't happening, then we can't populate faraway islands with biodiversity. Because the only way that some of the birds and some of the plants can reach 5,000 kilometers away is thanks to a hurricane. So we need to be able to see that sustainability has to be life enhancing. It has to enhance the capacity to diversify, to be resilient, to be happy. And when the worst hits, that you know, you're together, you'll get through. Several speakers this morning mentioned going back to the roots for finding solutions. Do you think we should look back or find innovations in where we are now or completely something else? All of the above. You need and going back and dreaming about things that have never been concocted before while at the same time breaking the mold and getting out of the corset in which we're stuck today. I mean, we are too set in thinking. I mean, I am amazed that I see eco villages being planned with a business plan. I see eco villages being planned with uh, a menu of how other eco villages did it. I, I'm surprised that we see eco-villages being certified eco-village. I mean, I, I think we need to get out of the too rigid way of thinking and realize that it is part rediscovery of what we were, it is part reimagining what we can be, and it is of course also part realizing where we are today and how getting from A to B. I mean, it is both the short term and the long term, but it needs to be guided by one common principle, which is the common good. Because what we have done in our society today is we have neglected the common good. We actually have started commercializing the common good. We started privatizing the common good. I mean, how is it possible that drinking water is a commercial item? It's life. How is it possible that healthy food is expensive. I mean, how come that junk food is cheap and healthy food is expensive? It doesn't make any sense. So the common good, which is nutrition and food, that we have lost. So we need to keep a few things clear again. Ancient societies always put the common good and the resilience in preserving the common good as a priority. We seem to have put all priority in the personal wealth accumulation. And we seem to have put our definition of happiness in the hands of the number of likes we get on Facebook, instead of uh, really being in a community where you make certain that everyone feels very much appreciated and grows beyond what they think they can do. You know, that is what resilience, community, common good is all about. And that is something that we have to rediscover because we've lost it. Um, now that you've been in Estonia for a while and you've heard the speakers today... 36 hours. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you have a bit of a, a idea of, of the place. Um, what could be the first topic that Estonia could easily set blue economy onto? Or what could be the 
pilot. I, I, I cannot pretend after such a short state to be able to advise the Estonians where to start and where to go. But I do know Estonians need to rediscover the beauty of their country beyond the forest and the tree and the wood and the cellulose. We need to go beyond what is the obvious. I think everyone needs to start rediscovering the surprises. I mean, let's not forget in our communities, in our family lives, surprises is what everyone likes. That's what birthdays are about and that's what the Christmas presents are about. I mean, we wrap everything up so that there's a surprise. But while we are enjoying the commercial side of the surprise, the gifts, we are not anymore looking for surprises in our ecosystems, in our communities. Let's be surprised. Let's discover what we have. We didn't realize we have. I mean, I got this beautiful book today about the fauna and the flora of Estonia. Well, I would like to have a beautiful book about the invisibles from Estonia. I mean, give me your 1000 mushrooms, give you your 1000 yeasts, give me your micro algae, give me, give me the things we don't see but are so important in your life. Your forests wouldn't work with it. I mean, can we see what we don't see? and discover what it could be good for. Because if we want to transform, you can't transform an animal with a plushy skin and you can't transform forests uh, with high trees uh, in a short while. But if you want to lay the ground for a bigger, greater, more fantastic, more inspiring, more surprising Estonia, the Estonians have to look where they've never looked before and discover surprises. Um, and to finish up, you emphasize the importance of storytelling to children. And you've published several children's books, I've heard. And um, the storytelling that would help us to remain the ability to dream. Is it too far-fetched to interpret that um, we will be raising a generation of social entrepreneurs that way then? You know... Everyone is born as an entrepreneur. Everyone wants to take care of the brothers and the sisters around. I mean, no one wants to just be on his own. Everyone wants to be with others. I mean, that is nature. That is our culture, our tradition. That is our mindset. That's how our brain works. Our brain doesn't work because we think, because we dialogue and we listen. So I believe that the storytelling is a great way to instill from a very young age the capacity to listen. You know, we are teaching in many schools the capacity to talk, but we should learn how to listen. And therefore, in order to listen, in order to have the attention of children long enough so they listen to the whole story, we better learn ourselves how to be great storytellers. It's not about apps on the iPhone or the iPad. It is not about having great movies from Disney. It's not about the Harry Potters that will be written and have been written. It's about the stories that we as a human being can tell to a kid with enthusiasm and with fascination because children, when they don't see the image, their mind is full of pictures. Their mind is seeing, and, and, and we can't steal that away from them. And today, we're not giving that opportunity to a child to create this incredible world that only exists in his mind. But fantasy is the first act of creativity. Without a world of fantasy, you can't create vision. Without vision, you can't move into a strategy, into action. You can't pass from an old science into a new science. It requires pure fantasy to start with. And so, to me, the greatest role of parents today, with all what is bombarded around the children, day after day, is to ensure that they are living up to that incredible capacity of any child to never make a difference between fantasy and reality. Everything is reality. And that's how life starts evolves 
and becomes challenging and great to live.